Okay, thanks a lot. So, uh, so it's an honor to speak at this event. Um, I've always admired Michelle's work in, in non-commutative algebraic geometry, which has really shaped this field. Um, and today I'm going to talk about one aspect of this subject, which is uh, non-commutative Enrique surfaces. Um, okay, so, so let me start just by saying that I'll work in this talk over the complex numbers, although that's not completely necessary. And um, before getting to Enrique surfaces, I want to say something about uh, the K3 case, which is both motivation and it'll turn out to be a useful tool uh, for the Enrique's case. So this is like part one of the talk uh, is the K3 case. Okay, so um, for me, a non-commutative variety is synonymous with a, a semi-orthogonal component of a variety. And so a K3, one of those, a K3 category, um, is a semi-orthogonal component. Uh, which I'll call C inside of D of X. Um, so in this talk, D of X will always denote uh, the bounded derived category of coherent sheaves. And here, X is supposed to be smooth and projective. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a non-commutative variety whose serif functor, which I'll denote by S sub C, is just equal to the shift by two. Okay, um, so just to remind you, right, a serif functor is by definition an autoequivalence, uh, which satisfies this property. It satisfies this sort of serif duality property uh, for objects E and F in the category C. So that's the definition of a K3 category. Let me just give you some examples. Um, Okay, and, and these examples, at least the interesting ones, uh, are all due to, to Kuznetsov. Okay, uh, so the first example, example zero, is uh, sort of the obvious one. C is equal to D of S, uh, where S is a K3 surface. Okay, and so technically with my definition, you could also say, you know, D is equal to S where S is an abelian surface. So uh, really there are, you know, there are more things you could impose in the definition of a K3 category, like maybe the talk shield homology agrees with that of a K3 surface. But for the purposes of this talk, I won't do that. I'll leave the definition as general as possible. Uh, but what I really have in mind is something that's more K3-like. So D of a K3 surface is like the basic example. Uh, of one of these things. So that I would say is sort of an, a non-interesting example. And here's maybe the first really interesting example, uh, which is C equal to uh, what I'll call the Kuznetsov component, Q of X, where X inside of P5 uh, is a cubic fourfold. Okay, and so I'll just remind you that by definition, this, uh, this component, Q of X, is defined as this semi-orthogonal uh, component, which is orthogonal to O, O of one and O of two. Okay, so that's maybe the first really uh, interesting example. And of course it's attracted a lot of attention in recent years. Um, let me list a couple other examples. So the next one, again, they'll all be uh, Kuznetsov components. So the next one is Q of X, where X is what's called uh, a Gushal Funkai. So for short, I'll just write GM uh, fourfold. So let me just tell you explicitly, what are these things? There, there are sort of two types of them. Uh, so this, this X is either a complete intersection of the Grossmannian in the Blucher embedding. So GER 2.5 with uh, um, a P8, so a hyperplane and a quadric. So this is happening inside of the Pluker space P9, and Q is supposed to be a quadric. Um, or X is supposed to be a double cover 
uh, of a linear section, so an intersection with P7 now, uh, which is branched along a quadric section. So this is a two to one cover branched along GER25 intersect a co-dimension two linear space intersected with a quadric. Um, so this is, you know, that's just some explicit class of fourfolds that I've written down for you. And again, there's an interesting semi-orthogonal decomposition that looks as follows. So there's the Kuznetsov component, and then there's a couple exceptional objects. So in this case, there's four of them. Um, so U here is the tautological rank two bundle on the Grassmannian uh, restricted to X. And those, those objects I wrote down turn out to give you an exceptional sequence and the orthogonal is a K3 category. Um, and let me just write down one more example. So you could, you could take C to be the Kuznetsov component uh, of what's often called a debar Voisin uh, variety. And such a thing is by definition uh, a hyperplane section of this Grassmannian GER310. And I won't write down the semi-orthogonal decomposition that defines it exactly uh, because it's a little bit more complicated, but it's again, this component is the orthogonal to a bunch of uh, a bunch of exceptional objects. And in this case, it's, uh, there's a lot of them. There's 108 of them. Okay, but the, the basic principle is sort of the same. You have a Fano variety, and then there's some exceptional collection, and it's orthogonal is a K3 category. And uh, as I said, these, these are examples due to Kuznetsov, who has sort of a general theorem describing serifunctors of semi-orthogonal components. And it gives lots and lots of K3 categories. So this is the first in sort of a series of examples here. Um, okay, so let me make a remark. Uh, the remark is that these examples are all different in the sense that Uh, if I if I look at x and x prime as in one of these examples, then these Kuznetsov components are not equivalent uh, for x and x prime. Very general uh, of different types. So this is really giving us sort of different families of non-commutative K three surfaces. Uh, however but they are all deformation equivalent. Okay, and there's a little, this isn't completely known. So they are all deformation equivalent, but in case three, this is still conjectural. So this last part is still conjectural uh, in example three. And uh, I'll explain in just a minute why these uh, why these categories are deformation equivalent. Um, but I just wanted to say now that they are really giving you different K3 categories. Uh, it's just sometimes they coincide. So, so let me tell you just a little bit more about what you can do with these examples. And I'll focus on uh, examples one and two. So, um, the cubic fourfold and these GM fourfolds. And these are really the cases where, which have been the most studied, so we know the most about them. And so let me start just with sort of two motivating conjectures about uh, these examples. So the first one, which is I think really well, well known by now is this conjecture of Kuznetsov, which says that uh, the fourfold X is rational if and only if, the K3 category is equivalent to D of a K3 surface. Okay, so I think, you know, that's a really beautiful conjecture and it's motivated a lot of work. Um, it's still uh, very much open, although we know some special cases of it. And then there's one other conjecture, which I want to mention in this context, which is kind of related. Uh, and I think this, 
was originally asked by Huybrex. And it says that if Q of X1 is equivalent to Q of X2 in one of these two examples, then X1 is birational to X2. Um, so you could think of this conjecture as being a kind of categorical uh, birational Torelli. So it says that uh, up to birational equivalence, your, your variety is determined by this K3 category. And also this conjecture, you know, we know some cases of it, but in general, I, I think it's pretty open. Um, but the, the general idea is that these K3 categories really control a lot of the birational geometry of the Fano varieties, of the Fano fourfolds. And uh, although these, these things are very much open, there is sort of one tool that could be useful in approaching these questions, and it's the following. So it's, uh, it's moduli spaces of objects in these categories. Um, so so I'll, let me write down a theorem which sort of summarizes what, what's known about these moduli spaces of stable objects. So this is a theorem, uh, and there it's due to different authors depending on whether you're in example one or example two. So let me write the initials BLM NPS stands for Bayer, Lahoz, McCree, Newer, myself, and Stellari. So that's the, the first paper. And then the second one is a paper with Pertuzzi and Zhao. Um, and this theorem is going to describe moduli spaces of objects in these two examples. So what's the setup? So we'll start with, let me write this on a new line. So we'll start with some primitive vector V in the, uh, the numerical K theory of our category C. So C is supposed to be Q of X, the same notation as above. Uh, and by definition, let me just remind you, this numerical K theory is the following. So you take the growth in D group of your category and you mod out by the kernel uh, of the natural Euler pairing. So this Euler pairing is by definition, if you have two objects, you just take the alternating sum uh, of the dimension of the X groups between them. And that gives you a pairing. And if you mod out by the kernel, you get this numerical K theory. And so I want to fix a primitive vector in there. It just means it's not divisible. F fix a primitive vector there. And I'll also fix uh, a generic stability condition on this category C. Um, so there's, there's something which is being hidden here, which is that it's not obvious that stability conditions exist in the first place. Um, so the existence of stability conditions in the case of a cubic fourfold was proved by B, L, M, and S. And it was proved by, by these authors in, uh, in example two. And then there's also this thing here, I put a little dagger. So that refers to a distinguished connected component of the space of stability conditions. Um, so there's some little technicalities behind this, but the way you should think about it is you just, you know, you fix a, a generic stability condition on this category, which, which is known to, to exist by some hard work. And, uh, and the upshot, what you get out of this is the following. So you can look at a moduli space M sigma V. So this is the moduli space. of sigma stable objects in C uh, of class V. Um, okay, I'm gonna write the conclusion of the theorem. Maybe I'll write the conclusion of the theorem and then I'll say something about it. So the statement is that this moduli space is non-empty uh, if and only if the expected dimension which is this number I'm writing down now, is bigger than or equal to zero. And in this case, when it is non-empty, it's a smooth, projective, holomorphic, symplectic variety uh, of this dimension. 
of this expected dimension. Okay, so um, so if you're not familiar with this theory of bridge length stability, very roughly you can think of it as like an analog of of slope stability in the case of sheaves. The stability condition, a stability condition sigma gives you some reasonable moduli functor uh, for for objects in your category of of class V. So V is like the um, the numerical data that you assign, and you know the. There's a lot to this theory, but very roughly, that's how you should think of it. It gives you a way to define potentially well-behaved moduli spaces. And what this theorem says is that in this case, they really are extremely well-behaved. They're non-empty exactly when you expect them to be. And uh, in that case, they're smooth projective holomorphic symplectic varieties, meaning in particular, they carry uh, a holomorphic two, a non-degenerate holomorphic two form. And so, uh, I think this theorem is kind of interesting because it's pretty hard to make holomorphic symplectic varieties, and this gives you a, a large family of uh, of maximal dimension of, of these kind of varieties. Okay, and maybe just to connect this with the with the conjectures I mentioned up here, I'll state this corollary. Uh, so the, it's not obvious why this corollary follows from the theorem, but it turns out without much work it does. So the corollary is that. C is equivalent to D of a K3 surface uh, if and only if there exists a copy of the hyperbolic plane inside of this lattice, uh, inside of the numerical K theory. Okay, so it gives sort of a completely uh, lattice theoretic description of this condition appearing in, in the rationality conjecture. Okay, and I, I think in general, these, these moduli spaces can be useful for understanding the geometry of these Fano varieties. Okay, so that, uh, that's sort of my summary of the case of K3 categories. And you know, the way you should think about it is that there are a lot of examples of these non-commutative K3 categories, which occur in Fano, in Fano varieties. Uh, they have really interesting moduli spaces, and there are some nice relations to birational geometry. And what I want to talk about for the rest of today uh, is a kind of a parallel story where K3 surfaces are replaced by Enrique surfaces. So, are there any questions or is this okay? Okay. Um, so, let me, let me move on to this Enrique's case now. Uh, so, part two. is Enrique's. And so there's a definition uh, which is, is similar to the K3 one. So in Enrique's category is a semi-orthogonal component D inside of D of Y, uh, where Y is again, some smooth projective variety. So it's a non-commutative variety um, with stair functor equal to tau composed with the shift by two, uh, where tau is an involution. So to be a little bit more precise, let me say where tau is the generator of a Z mod two action on our, on our category D. Okay, and like the K3 case, you know, you could you could require and maybe you should require some additional things. Like you you might want to say that tau is non-trivial, for instance, or you might want to require something about Hochschild homology, but let me just take the most general definition of an Enrique's category. And so again, like the K3 case, there are a lot of interesting examples. Um, so first let me start with a non-interesting one. So the first example and the sort of the most basic one is D of T, where T is in Enrique's surface. Okay, so by, by definition, um, this means that the canonical bundle of this surface, if you look at its square, it's trivial and the corresponding 
two to one cover S to T. So we have this line bundle, which is whose square is trivial. So we get an etale cover, which I'll call S. And this thing is supposed to be a case-free surface. Okay, so in other words, Enrique surfaces are like the, qu the quotients of K3 surfaces by fixed point free uh, involutions. And so this is an example of an Enrique's category. And here, tau is just given by tensoring uh, with the canonical bundle uh, of T. Okay, so that's, uh, that's sort of a silly example, but there are also more interesting ones. Uh, so let me write down a couple of them. So the first one, again, these will be uh, certain Kuznetsov components. So D is Ku Y, where Y is a quartic double solid. Uh, so let me remind you that by definition, a quartic double solid, it's a, it's a certain Fano threefold, and it's the double cover of P3 which is branched along uh, a cortic hypersurface, so a cortic uh, K3 surface. And uh, in this case, there's a semi-orthogonal uh, decomposition that looks as follows. So there are just two line bundles, and then the orthogonal is Q of Y. And maybe I should just say, so what is, what does this tau end up being in this case? Well, there's a natural guess and it's, it's the right answer. So in this case, tau is equal to uh, the covering involution. So the covering involution of Y, it preserves these components and therefore it acts on Q of Y. And uh, the ser functor of Q of Y is tau composed with shift by two. Uh, that's, that's the statement in this example. So let me do another example. Uh, again, it'll be uh, corresponding to a Fano threefold. And in this case, Y will be a, a GM threefold. So these are defined so, sort of uh, analogously to, to the way GM fourfolds were defined earlier in the talk. But let me just write it down explicitly. So Y in this case is this Grossmannian again. And then now you intersect it with two hyperplanes in the Pluker embedding and a quadric. So that's that's one type. And again, there's two types. So the other type is uh, a double cover of the Grossmannian intersected with a P6. And this should be a double cover branched along a quadric section. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, and in this case, there's a semi-orthogonal decomposition, which looks kind of similar to the fourfold case. So there's this component, and then there are two exceptional objects, where again, U is the, the rank two bundle on the Grossmannian. Okay, so those are, those are two examples. Let me see, how am I doing on time? 24. Okay, maybe I can give one more example because I'm doing all right on time. So... These are maybe the most studied examples, I would say, of Enrique's categories, but you can make lots of other ones using this theorem of, of Sasha's that I mentioned. Uh, so let me just give one more. So you could take D to be Q of Y, where Y is a uh, degree three, degree six hypersurface inside of this weighted projective space. And I'm thinking of weighted projective space here as like a as a DM stack. So this is like a stacky Fano threefold. And in this case, uh, there's a semi-orthogonal decomposition with a couple exceptional with a few exceptional objects. And again, this gives you an Enrique's uh, category. Okay, so these are, and as I said, you can make more examples too. But these are the ones I wanted to focus on today, really. Example one and two here. Alex, um, um, what's the first Hochschild homology of this third example? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I didn't compute it. Maybe someone knows off the top of their head. Um, 
I just made this example before the talk. So yeah, I don't know actually, but someone, you could compute it, but I haven't done it, so sorry. Any other questions? Oh, no, no, go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, no, it's a good question. Someone should, I should have computed it. I just didn't have time to. Um, okay, so let me make one remark about sort of parallel to the one that I had in the K3 case. So the remark is that examples one through three, well, it's kind of parallel, but it's in some ways, it's the opposite of what happened in the K3 case. So in examples one through three, these Kuznetsov components, the remark is that these are not uh, deformation. Equivalent. Uh, to example zero. Okay, and there are various ways you could prove that. So one way is, uh, as was related to the question that was just asked, you could compute Hochschild homology. I'm sure it's at least non-zero in a degree to contradict being uh, equivalent to example zero and example three. But So there are various ways you can prove this, but there is some numerical invariants which obstruct examples one through three uh, from, from being deformation equivalent to the derived category of an actual Enrique surface. So they're really kind of totally different examples in a sense. Um, and that, that will make the story a little bit more complicated in some ways for, for, Enrique, for these Enrique's categories. Um, so today, uh, I want to focus on these, the two examples one and two, which are maybe the most interesting ones, and they're certainly the most studied ones. Um, so quartic double solids and GM threefolds. And let me let me just sort of state three theorems about these, um, which are kind of, which are morally related to the ones that I wrote down for K3s. And then I'll spend the rest of the talk explaining something about what goes into the proofs. So here's theorem one. Uh, so this is a result that I proved with uh, Aaron Beyer. So let's let Y be a GM threefold uh, and Y prime a quartic double solid. Um, then there, there are two parts to this theorem one. So the first part says that uh, Q of Y is just never equivalent to Q of Y prime. So there, there don't exist any GM threefold and quartic double solid where these Enrique's categories are equivalent. Uh, even though maybe I should say numerically, it looks like this is possible. Like all of the numerical invariants are the same for these categories. On the other hand, the next best thing is true, which is that these categories are deformation equivalent. So there is like a, a one parameter family of categories, which, uh, which interpolates between the two. And maybe just as a remark, well, maybe there's two remarks. So the first remark is that this first part was also proved in a different way by Shizu Zhang. And, uh, and then the second remark is that this theorem, uh, it sort of simultaneously disproves and proves uh, a conjecture of Kuznetsov. So let me just explain what I mean by that. So I think originally when Sasha thought about this problem, his hope was that there would exist a GM threefold and a quartic double solid such that there is an equivalence like this. And that was his original conjecture. Um, so one says that that conjecture is not true. But, you know, after that, Sasha modified his conjecture to say that these categories are at least deformation equivalent. And so that is indeed true. And that's what the second part of the theorem says. Um, okay, so that's maybe answering one of the basic questions you could have about these categories. Although they're, they're not isomorphic in general, they are at least deformation equivalent. Okay, so theorem two, that's the first theorem. What's theorem two? This was again with, uh, with Aaron Beyer. So let's, let's assume that we have an equivalence 
uh, between y1 and y2, between the coup of y1 and coup of y2, then the statement is that y1 is birational to y2 if these y's are, are gm threefolds. And even better, they're just isomorphic on the nose if the yi are quartic uh, double solids. Okay, so you can think of this as like, a, again, it's sort of a categorical version of birational Torelli, but in this situation of Enrique's categories in Fano threefolds, we can actually prove it. Whereas in the case of K3 categories in Fano fourfolds, it's still conjectural. Um, so that's the second theorem. What am I doing on time? Oh, I'm actually doing really good on time. Uh, okay, so that's the second theorem. Let me just pause for a second and see if there are any questions. Okay, so let me state the the third the third theorem for today. Uh, so this is recent work with Pertuzzi and Zhao, and uh, this this last theorem has to do with the structure of the moduli spaces in these Enrique's categories. So let's say that D uh, is equal to Q of Y, as in examples one or two. So it's you know either for a GM threefold or a quartic double solid. And let me fix uh, some non-zero numerical class. So some non-zero element in the numerical K theory of D. And maybe it's worth noting that you can just completely explicitly compute what this numerical K theory is. And in either example one or two, it's isomorphic to, um, to this rank two lattice. So it's very explicit. This, we have this rank two lattice and I choose a non-zero vector in there. Um, and then I'll also choose sigma to be a stability condition on D, which is ser invariant. Okay, so let, let me define what this means just very briefly. So by definition, ser invariant means the following. So IE, this is fixed by the, the stability condition sigma. Well, so if, if you have a stability condition and you have an autoequivalence, you can act via that autoequivalence on your stability condition to get a new stability condition. And uh, the requirement is that this sigma is fixed by the ser functor. If not on the nose, it's at least fixed up to the natural reparameterization action on the central charge. So it's fixed by the ser functor. So IE sigma is fixed by the ser functor modulo the action of GL2 plus R. Okay, if, and if you haven't thought about stability conditions before, you can just think of it as you have a stability condition and in some precise sense, it's fixed by this auto, by the, by the ser functor. Um, so it's invariant under ser duality in a sense. And maybe I should say, so this is sort of parenthetical. There exists a unique such sigma, again, up to this action. And uh, that's due to, to the work of a bunch of people. So maybe I won't write all of their names. Um, basically, first, you have to prove that there exist stability conditions at all on this category. And that goes back to this BLMS work, uh, Bayer, Lahoz, McCree, and Stellari that I mentioned earlier. And then you need to prove that it's ser invariant and also that it's unique. Um, and so that was proved in a series of works by various people, but uh, I won't list all of their names because there's sort of too many of them, but most of them uh, involve Laura Pertuzzi. So I'll just say Pertuzzi and others, dot, dot, dot. So sorry to anyone whose name I'm forgetting here, but um, but yeah, so there's a, there a unique ser invariant stability condition. And so now I can state the theorem you fix this numerical class, you fix it, the unique ser invariant stability condition. Uh, and then the conclusion is that the moduli space of 
sigma semi-stable objects of class V is non-empty and it's uh, smooth of dimension minus chi of VV plus one uh, at, at any object E, which is not fixed by this autoequivalence tau. So, so remember, by the definition of being a uh, Enrique's category, we have the serif functor is this involution tau composed with the shift by two. And what I'm saying is that this moduli space, if you look at an object at it in, in this moduli space, which is not fixed by the involution, then that defines the smooth point of the moduli space. And the dimension there is given by the expected dimension. Um, and in particular, these, these moduli spaces are always non-empty. So, so there are more detailed things you can say about the geometry, uh, but maybe I won't write them all down here. Like for instance, you know, explicitly you can realize this moduli space as a double cover of some Lagrangian in a hypertaylor variety. Um, you can show that it's generically smooth for most choices of vector V. Uh, it's generically smooth for every choice of vector V when Y is a GM threefold. Etc. So there are various things about the geometry you can show, but maybe the one I want to emphasize is, is the non-emptiness, which in many cases, that's sort of the hardest part of these theorems, is to show the existence of any stable object whatsoever. Um, so maybe I'll just leave the statement of this theorem at this. Uh, we get non-emptiness of these moduli spaces in Enrique's categories. So are there any questions about um, any of these theorems before I tell you a little bit about what goes into the proof? Okay, so there's a question, but oh, there. wait, should I be able to hear it? Oh, there's a delay, like you said. Okay, is we assume to be primitive here? Um, let's see. Oh, that's a good point. Maybe I, I think I need that for the smoothness. Yeah, sorry. So maybe let me just say that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you get non-emptiness. Um, actually, I'm not even sure if I need that for the smoothness. I think I might not need primitivity at all. Let me, let me just say primitive, because if you know it when it's primitive, in particular, you'll get non-emptiness in a non-primitive case just by taking direct sums. So just to be safe, let me say primitive here. Is that okay? But yeah, as I said, the non-emptiness reduces to that case anyway. I think that was Sasha. Sasha, are you happy or? Okay, I'm gonna, wait, I don't hear anything. So I'm gonna keep going. Uh, okay, I just can't see, like maybe I'm supposed to be able to see in the thing, that's fine. Sorry, I'll keep going, okay. Uh, yeah, so there are these three theorems. Let me tell you a little bit about what goes into the proof uh, of these theorems. So this is part three. I'll tell you about this notion of the K3 cover uh, and a little bit about the proofs, at least for, for some of the theorems. So the basic idea for the, the proofs of these theorems is to, to reduce to the case, to reduce to something about the K3 situation. Uh, that's how it goes in the classical story. When you study Enrique surfaces, you often want to, to study them, you want to relate them to, the, to a K3 surface. And so in our context, the mechanism for doing that is a, a theorem by Elegan, um, which is more general than what I'm about to state. It's sort of something more generally for a category with a group action. Um, but I wanna say what it says in our specific situation. So um, let D be in Enrique's category. Um, so remember by definition, that means in particular, we have this this action of Z mod two on the category. And I'm gonna define C 
to be the invariant category for this group action. Uh, so by definition, what, what is this category, this category of invariance? So let me give a name. Remember tau is like the, the generator of our Z mod two action. And by definition, this category D superscript Z mod two, this category of invariance, its objects are just given by linearized objects of D. So it's given by a pair E and phi, where E is an object of D and phi is an isomorphism between E and tau applied to E uh, such that if you do it twice, so if you square phi, you get the identity, uh, you know, interpreted in the, in the obvious sense. So it's uh, an object in this category. Again, it's just a linearized object. It's an object equipped with an isomorphism to the involution applied to that object uh, that squares to the identity. Okay, so you can, you can always define this invariant category. And then the theorem is that first of all, C is a K3 category, um, which I'll call the K3 cover of D. And that part's actually pretty believable, right? When, when you pass to the invariant category, you trivialize tau and the ser functor for D was tau composed with the shift by two. So once you trivialize this tau, your, your ser functor should be shift by two. Uh, so C is, C is a K3 category. And second of all, there exists something which I'll call the residual action of Z mod two on this K3 cover. And this action has an interesting property. It has the property that you can reconstruct D as the Z mod two invariant category for this action on C. Um, so here, let me just say explicitly, what is this residual action? So if I take an element in Z mod two, which I'll think of as plus or minus one, then it acts on a, on a pair E phi. It acts on an object in this category um, by keeping the object the same and just scaling the linearization by plus or minus one. So that defines an action of Z mod two on this category C. And the theorem says that if you form the invariance, you, you get back to your original category. So I think it's a pretty interesting result. Um, maybe I can just tell you, tell you an example sort of what happens. Um, so maybe the easiest way for me to do this is to just go back to this up here where I gave you a bunch of examples. Uh, okay, so let's see if I can do this. I, I sort of ran out of room. I want to add it here, but I didn't leave myself enough room. Okay, so, so let me tell you first what happens in in example zero, right? Um, if you do this construction of passing to, to the K3 cover. So what happens is what you would hope. So if you do this construction uh, to an Enrique surface, you, you get the derived category of the K3 surface, which is its cover. Um, so that's actually not that very difficult of an exercise for you to convince yourself of. And on the other hand, um, if you look at D of S, what is this residual action? So this acts by the involution. So the residual action uh, on the K3 under this identification here is exactly the involution of the K3. And then it's, you know, it's a well-known thing that if you form the invariant category, you get the derived category of the quotient, which in this case is just the Enrique surface. So this uh, this correspondence between Enrique's category and its K3 cover, in the case where your Enrique's category uh, is just the derived category of Enrique surface, it's the usual correspondence. So let me tell you what it is in our, in our two interesting examples. Uh, so in example one, what happens? So it turns out in example one, that this category is equivalent to um, the derived category of S. So if I have a quartic double solid branched along this quartic K3, 
um, then the K3 cover actually is that K3 surface S. So I proved this uh, with, with Sasha. Um, and then what about this example two here? So if I have a GM threefold, then I can look at the corresponding GM fourfold in the first case, which is this double cover branched along Y. So this is a GM fourfold. And the statement is that the K3 cover of Q of Y is Q of X. It is this K3 category that I mentioned earlier in the talk. And uh, finally, in this, in this last example, in this second case, the K3 cover is D of S, where S is this, uh, this intersection here, which is easy to check that that's a, that's a K3 surface. It's a degree 10 K3 surface. So, so kind of the principle here is that if you have an Enrique's category and you see somewhere lying around a K3 category, that's almost certainly the, the K3 cover. And so that's sort of what, what me and Sasha proved in these examples. And it's true in some kind of more general setting too. Um, okay, so that's how this construction of passing to the K3 cover works. And how do you use this to prove some of these theorems? Well, since I've only got a few minutes, I'm just gonna try to explain the very basic idea that goes into one of these theorems. So I'm gonna do, very briefly, I'm going to tell you what goes into proving uh, part two of theorem one. So why is the Enrique's category of a GM threefold deformation equivalent to the Enrique's category uh, of a quartic double solid? Um, so the reason So here's the proof of part two of theorem one. Um, So let's look at one of these uh, GM threefolds, which is a double cover branched along S. And then I'll consider a quartic double solid Y prime branched along a K3, uh, a quartic K3 S prime. So if you combine uh, Elegant's result together with the, the examples I just told you, you'll see that the Kuznetsov component of Y is uh, the equivariant category for the residual action of Z2 on this K3 surface. So I just told you above that the K3 cover is this guy. And so now you just apply part two of the theorem to see that you have an equivalence like this. And similarly, Q of Y prime is equivalent to D of S prime Z mod two. Um, so you can realize both of these Enrique's categories as the equivariant categories for some uh, action of Z mod two on certain K3 surfaces. And then really roughly the idea of the proof is that you find a specialization of K3 surfaces. So you can specialize S, uh, which is one of these degree 10 K3s to a quartic K3. And you can find one of these specializations, which is compatible with the Z mod two actions uh, on D of S and D of S prime. So that's really where there's a lot of work that goes into that, but that's what me and Aaron proved that you can find a specialization and you can make a Z mod two action along this whole specialization, which um, on the original K3 is the residual action appearing here, and on the cortic is the residual action appearing here. And then once you've done that, you're in business, because you can just, in a family, you can take the Z mod 2 invariants, and that will give you a family of categories that interpolates between uh, this Enrique's category and this Enrique's category. So that's the, uh, that's the basic idea of the proof of part two of theorem one. And, um, and for the other theorems, uh, theorems two and three, you know, 
each of them involves some sort of different ideas, but ultimately you try to reduce to some something about K3 geometry, which is a little bit more uh, trackable. And uh, I think these tools could be useful in other examples too, but we sort of have just considered the maybe first two interesting ones, the quartic double solves and the GM three folds. Okay, so uh, I think I'll stop here. Thanks a lot.